In this topic, let us learn this model, which is called the one factor model. Okay. To understand this model, what I'll do is I'll play around with, let's say, n random variables, which I denote by x1, x2, all the way till xn. Let's assume that all of these random variables, let's say they follow the same distribution, and that is the standard normal distribution. So each of these xi's I am saying is normally distributed with zero mean and one standard deviation. Okay. If I were to model these n variables, as I described this case in the, one of the previous videos, I would need to model their dependence structure and this dependence structure for normally distributed variables like xi can be captured simply by the correlation matrix. This correlation matrix would be of size n cross n and the number of values which this correlation matrix has, I'm not talking about the entire matrix because that I know has n square values. I'm talking about values in let's say the lower diagonal spaces or the upper diagonal spaces because those are the meaningful values, right? Because this matrix is symmetric, I know that the values which are you know, this is my diagonal, the values which appear here are the same values which appear here. So the meaningful bunch of values are, let's say, these values. How many values are these? So if you were to take all these variables and let's say count the number of pairwise correlations which I need to estimate or correlations which I need to work with, if I need to model all these variables, that number comes to NC2, okay? And NC2 basically comes to n into n minus 1 by 2. So I need these many entries, these many correlations, first to estimate these many and then to work with these many. Okay. So just put in some number here. Let's try and put in 50 here, right? So in a 50 asset case, this number turns out to be huge. Okay. So what we'll be devising in this video would be an alternative way to handle this situation which helps us reduce the number of variables, let's say, which we have to estimate or work with. And that's what this one factor model would be used for. It really helps us reduce this number. Okay, so let's start. The factor model that we want to design and work with is basically written as this. Okay, now, if you take a look at this model, you can actually link it with the previous video. In the previous video, I had said epsilon 2 is basically rho z1 plus square root of 1 minus rho square z2. So if, if it comes down to like overload of formulas, I think the one factor model and this formula, they are quite similar, right? Look at this, it's the same kind of formula, right? Instead of rho, you have an alpha and instead of z1, you have an f, instead of z2, you have a zi. Right? So what we are saying here is that let us express this guy xi, let it be the return of the ith asset to be a combination of returns coming from two assets. So let the first asset be what I call f, f means the factor, that's why it's called a one factor model. There is one factor involved in this model. This is the f plus some weight times a second guy, let's call it zi. Now zi is an asset which is unique to my original asset xi. That is why I have indexed it with the same letter i i. So for every original asset in my portfolio, let's say x1, I would need a new z1, okay, x2, z2 and so on. So what I'm saying here is that the returns of this guy, this asset, let they be driven by some component of returns which come from a common factor plus a component of returns which come from a factor which is purely associated with xi, okay? So this would actually become more clear when we do portfolio theory. But till then, let's just understand this model purely from, let's say, a statistics viewpoint in terms of how it helps us reduce our burden about data required, okay? So to get this model working, what all do I need? Firstly, for every asset, I need to estimate this alpha i. For every asset, I need this new variable zi. Let's talk about distributions of every variable. xi, I know, is standard normal distribution. 
Let's impose the same distribution assumption on both f and zi. So f I'm saying is also standard normal, z is also standard normal. Okay. Now let's impose conditions with regards to dependence. So let's say there is no correlation between f and z, number one. So f and z, no correlation. Similarly, let's assume that there is no correlation between the z's of any two assets. So take a z of the ith asset, so zi, and take the z of the jth asset, zj. And let's assume that there is no correlation or covariance between any two zi or zj, in, picked in any pairwise manner, okay? One more assumption which I need, to make this square root guy work, I cannot have alpha which has a value of outside minus one and one, otherwise the term inside the square root will become negative. So therefore, let's assume that alpha is a number which takes a value strictly between minus one and one. So with these assumptions, let's see, based on our knowledge of statistics and all the results that we know, let's see how well we've done, okay? So let's start. If I express xi as this, am I sure that xi follows the distribution which I wanted to follow? Let's check that. The expected value of xi, that means should come out to be zero. So let's check it. Expected value of xi should be expected value of the formula for xi, which is alpha i f plus square root of one minus alpha i square z i. Alpha i and square root of this guy are constants. They can come out. Expected value of f, expected value of z, both are zero. So this gives me the expected value of x to be zero. So okay, so we've done well. Now let's check the second part is the variance of x one for every x. Just do this, just follow this, you know, I have this, this exactly the same proof which I did for variance of epsilon two in the previous video, right? It's the same proof and you get actually one, right? So this part is fine. Now comes the critical part. The critical part is we've proved that xi has the distribution which we wanted, but does xi's dependence with another xj, does that problem get solved? So to do that, let's do this. Let's try and find in this new world in which we have expressed all these returns as this model, let's try and find out the covariance between any two x's, right? Again, it's just a test of how well you know your stats formulas. So it would be, by the way, the individual means of these two is zero. So covariance of xi, xj would simply be the expected value of the product of xi, xj, right? So just take xi, take its formula, just take xj, take its formula in terms of f and zj, just multiply everything. This is the point where you would need these two conditions to work for you, right? The only term which will survive is this term, which is f square. All other terms because of these two conditions go away. So try it out. What you would find is that this guy comes to alpha i alpha j, okay? Which is to say that the correlation between xi xj, because the, the variance or standard deviation of them, each one of them is one, it means the correlation between xi xj in this new world is alpha i alpha j, okay? So what did, how did this benefit us? Remember the number of correlations I had to estimate without using this model, it was this huge number. After having used this model, all this model required us to do was to estimate alpha i for every asset. So how many estimations do we need to do? We need to do n estimations, one estimation for every asset. Once I have the alpha for every asset, I can get the correlation between any two assets as just the product of their alphas. So that's, the, that's this formula, right? So correlation between x1, x2 is just alpha 1, alpha 2. Correlation between x20 and x30 is just alpha 20 times alpha 30. So look at how my burden has reduced. This model basically helped me go from these many estimations to only these 50 estimations, if n is 50. That's the beauty of the one factor model. What other benefits does this model have? Let's take a look. First benefit is because you've used this model, you can be sure that the correlations that you finally arrive at, which is simply alpha i, alpha j, they create a matrix which is positive semi-definite. 
this is a very very good property to have okay the second one i've already told it to you from this data burden of n into n minus 1 by 2 you have now moved to only estimating n coefficients and that's it and this will help you populate your entire correlation matrix a practical example of one factor model keep in mind is the capm this the capital asset pricing model in this model the f that we talked about is basically the market it's the market return okay so we'll deal with capm in a dedicated reading i just wanted to at this point just highlight this fact that the one factor model is what we'll do as capm in portfolio theory okay this is about the one factor model